Greg? Hey, Tommy, hi. How you doing? Doing well. Oh, how you, how's everything over there in New York? end of uh, uh, the uh, hurricane, mm -hmm. tropical storm part. It's just raining. It's been raining most of the day. Oh, that is unfortunate. Yeah, well, it went on, it's all the way up to Boston, too, because uh, uh, they were playing a playoff game at Fenway Park today, and uh, they were playing in the rain the whole game. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, totally crazy. But anyway, so how... So, we ready to rock. You want to record this now, or how, how do you want to do this? Oh, I'm recording it. Okay. You are live. All right. So, um, yeah, it's such an honor uh, to for you to do this interview and stuff. I've been a fan of your stuff for years. Oh, well, man, a great taste, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. Just discern that for me. The very sound of your voice. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So, well, last... I've been doing this for a long time, as you know, and... Uh, mm -hmm. So you can ask me any questions you want, and if not, I can just start rapping. I mean, <laughs> just to shut me up, shut me, tell me to shut up after a while. Well, last night. You know anything in particular? I'm sorry. You want to know anything in particular? Oh yeah, I'm gonna go through a list of credits here. Okay. Last night I watched. Probably, it was probably, um, according to IMDb, your first uh, TV role. It was um, an episode of Gomer Pyle. Well, it wasn't my very first one, but it was, it was close. Uh, yeah, Gomer Pyle, can you believe it? Jim Nichols. Yep. I mean, it was fun. He, he was quite a guy. Although he had a, a little thing going with Roman Gabriel, the quarterback for the uh, Los Angeles Rams. I don't know if you ever heard that story, but Jim Nichols and he were pals. And they uh, mm. spent a lot of time together, and it was always tough because Jim uh, was another persuasion. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't like to talk about it at that time. It wasn't uh, okay to be a, 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 a gay. And uh, Yeah, I know I know, I know about the story about um, him and uh, Rock Hudson. Yeah, yeah, there was that story. There was that story about Roman Gabriel, the quarterback of the Rams, who went to the Super Bowl and, and uh, lost. But nonetheless... Uh, yeah, it was by, he invited me when, when I was doing um, Gomer uh -huh. to, uh, to come up to his place. He had a place at Lake Tile, which mm -hmm. I declined. I was married at the time, and, and uh, the marriage was McCray. Mm -hmm. And uh, God rest his soul. He died in 2000, as you maybe you know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so I, I respect, respectfully declined. Mm -hmm. And the weekend looking back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks anyway. But a really sweet guy. The sweet guy and a very nice guy and a talented guy. And he could sing. Yeah. A terrific singing voice. As people uh, found out because he did a lot of variety shows back in those days. Absolutely. And the singing, yeah. But no, the very first thing I ever did, I did with, uh, uh, I did the guy who played Kojak. Uh, what's his name? I'm going crazy. Telly Savalas. Uh, yeah, Telly Savalas. Mm. I, I, the verdict is yours. Combat. Combat is another one, yeah, all those, thank God, all those, yeah, those shows. 
shows, yeah. And I got all black and white back in the day. Yeah. One of the first things I did was a Bonanza, too. I did a Bonanza that was in black and white. Mm-hmm. And then it got into color, and I did another one in color. But back in those days, you know, television was still black and white, some of it. Yep. Not in the, this is in the 60s. Not the 70s, but... Yeah. I didn't do a show until 61, but my first one. Mm-hmm. I, and so, anyway, so I've done a lot of work in, in television, but most notably, you know, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, probably that, and the la last thing I've done of any note is iCarly. Mm -hmm. You know, I teach in New York, and some of the students that I've had in the, in the past, not so much now, because that era's kind of gone already, iCarly's kind of in the past. Uh, but uh, they had seen me on iCarly, and they were much more excited about that than the other television I had ever done. Right. Because as kids, when they were 12, 13, they watched that show. And so uh, I, I was very popular in their mind. <laughs> A lot of the students I was teaching here in New York, some of them still talk about it. Uh, I'm, su I'm sure they do. I mean, yeah. you, you are one of the great, like, prolific TV actors. In my day, yeah, but I, you know, believe it or not, I've done a lot, a lot of uh, stage work in my life. I've mm -hmm. done over 100 plays. I've started on Broadway. I just got done doing a play to close last week. Yeah. Uh, and that was great. And, and I, Marlo Thomas came to see it, so Donahue and nice. the other people. I'm going to see Marlo again on Friday. I'm going to go to George Street Place out in New Jersey, where a guy named Joe DiPietro. He did a, a play called I Love You, You're Perfect, Now Change. It ran for 18 years in New York City. Nice. The very first thing he ever did. <laughs> he wanted Tony from Memphis. Yeah. The musical Memphis. He, he wrote, he wrote a, a musical called Memphis and he wanted Tony for it. He's redoing I Love You, You're Perfect, Now Change. We're going to go see it Friday night uh, with Marlo and Phil. Nice. Have, 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 you, won, have you won a uh, Tony? No, I have not. No. I was, uh -huh. was talking about being nominated one time. I did a play <laughs> called Romantic Comedy. Mm -hmm. Me and played Mia, Mia, Farrow's, Mia Farrow's husband, along with uh, Tony Perkins. Yeah. And uh, Anthony Perkins, he likes to be called. And did, did Woody Allen make that into a movie? No, he did not. No, it wasn't. S somebody, somebody made made Romantic Comedy into a movie. Yes, they did. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't Woody Allen. Huh. I forget it was in the, the little English actor who played the piano. I can't remember his name now. Oh, yeah, Dudley Moore. Dudley Moore, yeah. Yeah. That's right. He did it on stage, too. That's right. He took my part. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what was it like uh, working on the, the shakiest gun in the West? Oh, my God. The Don Knotts. That was more fun. <clears throat> that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he's, he's a wonderful guy. And then I forget, I forget the girl who played the, the lead, a, a tall Amazonian, Amazonian kind of girl. Uh, uh, I forgot. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot too. My guy is terrible. Um, I should be looking these things up before I do interviews. <laughs> Mind myself of who, who was in it. She at the time was quite well known, and he, she was very tall, probably six one, six two, and he, mm -hmm. he's shorter than I am. And uh, that coupling was hilarious in, in it by itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a lot of fun. He was just a terrific guy to work with, Don Knotts. Nicest guy in the world. Mm -hmm. And fun and funny. <clears throat> and had more fun on him. I mean, that, that show was so fun. Yeah. You know, I've, I've worked a lot at Universal, and, and so I was delighted to be able to work with him. And uh, Jackie Coogan. Jackie. Yeah. yeah, Jackie Coogan worked with him, too. And, you know, a very good friend of mine is Anthony Coogan, his son. Oh, yeah. He was a terrific actor in it by his own right, and then has become a leading proponent, proponent of using 3D. He has a business using 3D mm -hmm. that's used, uh, the doctors use, as models for surgery. Yeah. And so it's very good with robotic surgery, especially now. Mm -hmm. uh, where you had a computer directing a, a robot to do the uh, decisions for you and all of the work. Certainly. And uh, so he's, he's done that. He's Jackie Coogan's son, Anthony Coogan, who was an actor. I did a show in Vegas with him called The Name's the Same. Yeah. That was great. <clears throat> we had had a list of offspring of big names, like Gary Lewis and the Playboys. Mm-hmm. Francesca Hilton, Baron Hilton, and Zaza Gabor's daughter, uh, Maureen Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan's daughter, mm -hmm. uh, Jackie Coogan's son, Anthony, was
my light up. Yeah, yeah. And and also uh, Frank Sinatra Jr. Oh. And uh, I'm trying to think. So, oh, and uh, Mickey Rooney Jr. too. And the interesting thing is when Mickey Rooney came, mm-hmm. took over the stage. We, we were playing the big big room at, at the Palace, at the Caesar's Palace. Yeah. And. Both Jerry Lewis and Nicky Rooney Jr. took over our show and did like 15 <laughs> minutes or 10, 15 minutes of their own stuff. Right. And, and then gave it back to us. And, and then what happened was Jerry Lewis didn't like the show and then made a deal with Caesar's Palace to put us in the lounge. Mm-hmm. And he took over the big room. Of course. I feel like that. Of course he did. Of course he did. So, that was an interesting time, too. And there was a kitchen strike in, in Las Vegas at the time. And they went on strike the uh, kitchen help. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden, those were the days when they were connected more in Vegas than they are now. Now it's quite legitimate. But in those days, all of a sudden, I told my wife, Meredith, that uh, we're going to leave because these guys, the guys were in the hallway, policing the hallway guys with dark suits, black shirts, and white ties. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, we're leaving, and we left, and we went back to L.A. for a while until the, the strike was over, and then we came back. <laughs> continued to do the show. We caught the crossfire between the, the hired people to come in and break the strike, which they did. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, get, and that crossfire between the kitchen workers and these guys who came in from New York, so. Wow, I've, I've never heard of the kitchen help going on strike. I've heard the, the writers, um, you know, stand-up comedians going on strike, but I've never heard the kitchen help. There's this, there's this joke I have. I say, you never see the police or the firefighters going on strike because somebody has to put out the fire. That's true. Yeah. They're not allowed to. Yeah. <laughs> as, as well, they should not. They have to pay them well enough, that's all. Yeah, they're paid well, well enough. They serve it, I think. Teachers, too, they don't make enough money. Oh, they don't, no. Especially. Yeah. Uh, I mean, our culture's just weird. We're so... We reward people, you know, athletes like crazy if they're very good. Uh, because we love our sports. I like I like sports, too. Yeah. But uh, it's inordinate that money, like... There's a picture that said you can for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Mm-hmm. Frankie. He makes... He's got a deal of $239,000 million dollars. Over a period of time, ten years or so, I think he's making thirty-four million a year, some ridiculous figure like that. But, and a teacher makes what fifty thousand? That's real lucky. Maybe twenty. Yeah, twenty. That's smaller town. Yeah, twenty-five. It's not something's wrong. Yeah. You know. Oh, I know. But anyway, blah blah blah. I know teachers who who work at Starbucks in the summertime. Oh, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Baseball players. My father was a baseball player. He played for the White Sox and the Red Sox. Yeah. And uh, he used to have to work in the winter back in the day because they didn't make that kind of money. When Colfax and Drysdale were told when, when they announced they were going to get a, they were going to give them a hundred thousand dollars a year, everybody was up in arms about oh way too much money. I mean, can, can you imagine what those two talents would make today? Yeah. I mean, maybe Colfax is the best pitcher I ever saw play the game. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, Nonetheless, you know, our values have gotten a little warped, but, uh, yeah, my grandma, money, money rules. Yeah, my grandma lived next door to Joe DiMaggio growing up. Really? Yeah, in San Francisco. San yep. Wow. Yeah. Was it the Mission District, or where was it? Uh, North Beach. North Beach, oh yeah, North Beach, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Are you Italian? We're not Italian. You're I'm, I'm, Ita- I'm Italian on my mom's side. My grandmother was Italian, yeah. You're Italian and... Croatian and... Um, Croatian. Irish. Yeah. 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 State. yeah. yeah. Oh, we could talk about that forever, too. My God. <laughs> but nonetheless... Um, you did Bob and Carol... It's the most fun I ever had on the show, though. Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. I mean, I'm going to see Louise last year uh, on the 25th, and then again the whole weekend we're going to go do an autograph signing. Oh, Tiffany. I wish I could be there. I've never done an autograph. I mean, I've done one that I did with my mother-in-law once. 
mm-hmm. in North Hollywood about 30 some odd years ago. Uh, Sheila McRae, mm-hmm. Gordon McRae's wife. And uh, I, uh, I thought I'd never do it again because I just thought it was, what did people want my autograph for? I was silly. Mm-hmm. And they got a little bit of money, it was fine, but, <coughs> but uh, she introduced me to it, Sheila, but I, didn't, I never did it again. But then I got talked into doing it with, by Louise, they were gonna do it together. Yeah. It's gonna be fun. It'll be fun. Yeah, I, I go to conventions. I love meeting my favorite stars and, and getting their autographs. It's fun. Well, that's great. Yeah, it should be a fun time. So I'm looking forward to it. It'll be fun. And then I'm doing a, I'm going to do a thing on the 25th. We're both going to a tribute to Rita Hayworth. Nice. Uh, Bud Moss, who was her agent, I think GAC was the agency or MC. I'm not sure which one. He was my agent for a while when he became an independent agent, but Bud was uh, Sidney Poitier's agent uh-huh. and Rita Hayworth's agent, and he traveled with her. He's written a book about it, and uh, he's establishing this award for many stars who people have forgotten. I mean, Rita Hayworth, my students don't know who she is. Oh, that's a shame. Isn't that a shame? Yeah. So he's establishing a award, award every year. <clears throat> Of note, like John Garfield or somebody like that, whom people don't know, younger people don't know, millennials don't know who these people are. He was a big star in his day in the 40s and 50s. Again, mm-hmm. yeah, in the 30s at the, with the group theater. He was a big star, and I know you, you know who John Garfield was. And even Jimmy Cagney, some people don't know who he is. Yeah, I love Jimmy Cagney. Yeah, me too. So he's established this, this, this the first award in the, 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 the I guess her name is Yasmin, his, her daughter, who is married to a Saudi prince, mm-hmm. is accepting the award. Nice. So that should be fun. Joel Gray's going to be there and a few other notables out and all the mom. Uh, Mother's not going to be able to go because she's out working for St. Jude. Mm-hmm. You know, raising money for St. Jude. They raise $600 million a year. Can you believe that? Wow. She does pretty much personally do that. She goes all over the country, raising money for it. Thank you. That's crazy. Yeah, it is. But the most fun I have I've ever had in a TV series, of course, of the four of them, is a Mary Hartman. Mary Hartman. We just had a blast during that show. Yeah, I like that show. Oh God, yeah, it was, it was great. You're- Ahead of its time in many ways, it still plays well today. The sales are pretty brisk. Mm-hmm. DVDs. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, we're happy about that. But um, I wish they'd play it more frequently on on uh, channels that play old stuff. I do too. You, you know who I like on that show the most is um, Graham, Graham Jarvis. Oh, God, Graham. He was a great guy. Oh, he's a, a scream. Great guy. Canadian. Yeah. My birth, yeah. He and I we were quite good friends on, on the thing of that man. We socialized with each other and their families on several occasions uh, during the run and then later too. But unfortunately, he's gone. Yeah. You know, so many people from our show have died. Victor Killian was the first to go. He played Grandpa. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I think it was Dodie Goodman. Yeah, Dodie Goodman. And then uh, Deborah Lee Scott. Deborah Lee Scott. And Phil Brunt. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and then Graham and Graham yeah. there were five people on our show already passed on and Deborah Lee was younger than anybody yeah except Claudia Lamb yeah I'll, our daughter there's like three of you left now or four I know you're right four of them oh my god ah! <laughs> well we're still we're still working so that's good yeah that is very good and, and Louise and I do we we uh Often get together mm-hmm. and go and do like a, an event here, <clears throat> like a luncheon. We'll show a, a scene from Mary Hartman, like the very first two pilot scene, uh, scenes, uh, a bedroom scene, mm-hmm. and uh, and then we do the scene as we are now. Yeah, and it's a pretty pretty wide difference, but nonetheless, the audiences seem to like it, so we do it. That's great. That's fun. Yeah. So many casts, you know, they, they they work together and then, you know, they never see each other again. But that's great. Yeah, well, Louise is a great, great friend. I see her probably a couple, every two months or so, if not more. Mm-hmm. I'm going to see her twice.
Yes, as a matter of fact, I just saw she came to see my play uh, a week ago Sunday. Is she doing good health-wise? And we all had dinner afterwards, so it was fun. She came to a matinee. Mm-hmm. Is she doing good health-wise, though? She's doing pretty well. Not great. She had a kidney transplant. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you know that her... Her, uh, Her boyfriend or life partner, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Michael Cipgianini is his name, and he's a terrific actor in his own right. I uh, just did a musical that my girlfriend wrote. Um, uh -huh. But he, uh, he gave her one of his kidneys. They're a match. Oh, that's Not only great. a match in life, but a match in, uh, in terms of that. So he's got one of his, she's got one of his kidneys. So she's doing fine. That's great. Yeah. Um, you did uh, Bob and Ted and Carol and Alice? Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, yes, I did. Yeah, I love that Bob, movie. Natalie Wood. She's one of my favorite actresses. I'm a huge Natalie Wood fan. Oh, me too. I love Natalie. She was a terrific girl. Lovely girl. And I, R.J. Wagner, I, I know pretty well, too. Yeah. And he's, he's a terrific guy. And they were a great match. And thankfully, they got back together before the tragedy hit. Mm hmm Gee. Yeah, when we were doing uh, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, a great little anecdote I'll pass along. Mm -hmm. There was a scene, I, I played the uh, therapist, as a young therapist. Yeah. Uh, and the big, big sir. Yep. I went up there to do research, and I got a whole story about that, too. But um, during the scene that we were doing, we were going to do a group hug, and, yeah. and she, everybody was crying, and she was crying. And before she did her close-up of the crying scene, everybody else cried because they were actors and they knew how to get to themselves and think of sad thoughts and be able to garner up some emotional life that was very real. Right. And she being a child actress that she was, before the take, she, the close-up, she called over to a <coughs> makeup guy, said, Bob, come on, and he blew pneumonia into her eyes. <laughs> but you could never to this day know that she had used that device in order to stimulate tears. She seemed, it seemed so real, just as real as all the people that had, that had garnered up some sad thoughts that made them, that made them cry, or whatever the thoughts may have well have been, it made them, <laughs> made them cry. But she was very good at that, very good. It would take studio, she learned from studios how to, how to act. Mm -hmm. And as a child. I love, yeah, I love it when um, Natalie Wood, I forget what she says to the waiter, but then she goes to apologize to him, and she's, and she's like, nobody should ever make anybody uncomfortable, and then she hugs him, and it makes him uncomfortable again. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Funny stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that was a lot of fun to do, too. Um, yeah, I just saw an interview well, with... Who, who helped who wrote the play. Yeah. I saw it. We improvised. We improvised for a couple of weeks almost before we did that movie. Mm hmm He picked our brains. He used some of it. We never got any credit, but but that that happened and he's he's a very good actor himself, by the way, Paul Mazursky. Oh yeah, he was in um, the Blackboard Jungle. Yes he was. It's a great movie. And one of my teachers, Peter Miller, was also in it. Mm -hmm. It's a cloakroom scene where he pointed a teacher. <laughs> Yeah. that he had his way with her but uh, that was a very controversial film when it first came out Blackboard Chapel oh yeah other than that yeah it sure was very good it was the first of many um, idealistic teacher movies that followed yeah yeah you're right it was To Serve With Love with Sidney Poitier you know uh, yeah. Dangerous Minds with Michelle Pfeiffer so many of them um in the mid '80s, you you did um, an episode of the Twilight Zone revival that was directed by Wes Craven. Yes, I did. What was that like? He was a, he was a terrific guy, and I and uh, I loved working with him. He was just the nicest man in the world, mm -hmm. and not all directors are. Yeah. Uh, but most of most of them are. But those the ones that aren't, you remember just even more than the ones that are nice. Yeah. Are so, it's very difficult to work under those kinds of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Henry Hathaway comes to mind. He was, I did a movie called The Raid on Rommel with Richard Burton. 
Oh, yeah. And there was a scene that I, he never yelled at me, thank God. But one German <laughs> actor that he'd gotten from, hope, I mean, something Heroes, I can't remember the name of it. Um, not Hogan's Heroes, but... Uh, Kelly's Heroes? Kelly's Heroes. Yeah. Kelly's Heroes. A German actor he'd gotten from uh, Munich, München. Mm -hmm. And he was playing a tank commander, a German tank commander. And it took him 56 takes to do this one thing. And finally, half the halfway screened it and made it worse. After about 10 takes, he screamed, Nobody in damn cross lost the damn war. He can't remember a damn thing because he kept blowing his lines. Because half the way intimidated people so much. Yeah. We shot that movie uh, in Baja, California. Yeah. And a little fishing village called San Felipe. And Richard Burton had just filmed Night of the Iguana uh, across the, uh, the uh, well, that part of the bay that between Mexico, that Baja California and Mexico itself. Right. And uh, they built a airstrip there so Elizabeth Taylor could come in. She came and spent, oh, about three or four days with us. And they built a, uh, a little fishing village. They built <laughs> not a lean to, but this <clears throat> cement block kind of sweet for which and uh, and and her very rapidly, so they would have a place to stay. We were in concrete like little bunkers on the beach there, but we we were a little became a little cozy family. And I ate right next to her and drank with him. And, it was like a little family we had there, except for Henry. It was very difficult to get along with. He never swore at Richard, but he swore at everybody else. Yeah. He took good care of the stars. Um, that was an interesting little anecdote, too. Mm -hmm. You know, they came, they, they shot that movie, Night of the Iguana, in part of the art. Mm -hmm. An art movie. They used footage from, if you look at that movie, right on Rome, you'll see footage of a tank going down or a convoy going down a road. You'll see a light, a white line at times and a no white line at other times. So they took, they took uh, footage from the George Papard film. I think it was called Guns of Tobruk. Oh, yeah. Um, and used footage from that. As Burton, they made Burton wear this universal picture. They made Burton give a blonde wig or blonde hair for the role and he <laughs> yeah. match the part's blonde head. <laughs> so the so some of the time you'll see the back of Richard Burton's head, George Papard's head. Oh my god. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, they they shot we shot that film in maybe three weeks or less. Mm hmm A war picture. And but because they use a lot of footage from that other movie. Wow. Yeah, well, tricks of the trade, you know. And Hathaway directed it. Mm -hmm. I did another movie for him later, and that was the last time I ever wanted to work for him. God rest his soul, too. But, yeah. Yeah. So. But working working with Wes Craven was a good experience? Yes, it was. I'm sorry. Yeah, we got, I got sidetracked there. It's yeah. okay. Yeah, he was terrific, and it was a, it was a terrific little take on, on Twilight Zone, you know, a, a dystopian take on it that, yeah. that everybody was dead because of uh, everything, was, everything was frozen, mm -hmm. pretty much, except my wife and I. And uh, I just had a lovely time with him. He was a very easy guy to work for. And there's uh, no pressure. And we got it done in, in time. Uh, mm. was it? So it was just a delightful experience with Wes Craven. Although I never understood it, the dark part of him. It could write. Yeah. <laughs> and direct movies that were a little less than the... Uh, well, not that genre. It's not my favorite genre, but... Uh, yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street and all that. Yeah, yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street. Not my cup of tea. You know, I know people love that kind of stuff, though. Some people love horror movies. Not my son, but not my cup of tea, but nonetheless, certainly has a, a genre that has a big, wide audience, so God rest his soul, too, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, Judith Barcy was in it? Yeah. The 
before she passed a few years later, unfortunately. Yeah, she was. Yeah, and I, there was, who else? I forget who else is in it, but... Melinda Dillon? Melinda Dillon, yeah, Melinda. Melinda I had known before, and uh, had worked with her. With, uh, I'd done a thing for a, a Catholic priest at a show on Saturdays. Mm-hmm. I did a, a thing with... with Melinda for him and she had fallen in love with the guy Father Kaiser which is kind of wild <laughs> but uh, became a convert to Catholicism because of it which is pretty interesting yeah I don't think I'll ever watch a Christmas story the same again <laughs> yeah me either me either no no, no I won't uh, <laughs> so um, but Wes was a terrific guy I, I never got to know him well uh, I wish I had, I had but I didn't I've never really talked to him after that, but very friendly on the set and, and a good guy. I had lunch together a couple of times. And it was a, just a delightful, very delightful experience working for a guy who had dark, dark, dark thoughts. Yeah. And he made it into a genre and, and made a fortune on Yeah. God love him. That's a dream I'm not too far away from myself. I, I write horror movies. Oh, you do? Yeah. I never... Well, other than that, I've really, well, I guess I've done a few. Oh, yeah, you did, uh... One might call, yeah, one might say, I guess you could call it. My Friends Need Killing? My Friends Need Killing comes to mind, yeah. It was not, you know, that was not called that, by the way. It was called Echo of a Massacre, originally. Uh-huh. But it became a kind of a cult film. Mm-hmm. And so they changed it to, to uh, My Friends Need Killing, and it was much better with the box <laughs> And much better at DVD sales. Yeah. Which is crazy, but nonetheless. It's a cult film. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just talking about a you know, long career and not back to doing what I originally became an actor doing, which is doing theater. Mm-hmm. I mean, I started in theater and I'm winding up in theater. And I, I like the, I, I really love being on stage. Yeah. As opposed to a film and television I like. But... Ed Asner and I talked about this a, a bit the last time I saw it. We talked again about ageism. You get a certain age in our business, and yeah. unless you're below 40, or, or look like you're around 40, you don't work as much anymore Yeah. On television. And the younger generation doesn't remember who the hell you are. So, but theater, they're not so concerned about age. And as long as you can remember lines and, and and have a good voice and could be heard on stage. Uh, you become your genre. I mean, you're, you're a cup of tea only in the sense that you own, they don't stop. The director can't say, well, okay, stop, let's do that again. Or I want to do it a different way or shoot it a different way. It's a whole, right. an actor's medium. Whereas film and television, are, well, mostly film more than television, is an actor's, is a uh, director's medium. Right. And, uh, you don't have to say about the finished product. You do as an actor, though, when you're on stage. So I, I love to see you. I like the immediate feedback, so it doesn't pay as well. But nonetheless, it's what I love to do, and, and I'm having a great time doing it. And plus, I'm teaching. Yeah. So I really love that. Giving back what I know to, to the younger generation is something that's very satisfying for me. And, and uh, I, I enjoy the heck out of it. I have a class here workshop that I have called the Working Actors Workshop. Right. And uh, for those listeners who would like to avail themselves of an opportunity to see what we're doing there, uh, I can be reached at uh, uh, 646-850-858-1360. So there, I got a plug in. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of inspiring actors listen to this show. I hope they do. Yeah, well, I can be reached on Facebook. Yeah. The first, yeah. I wanted to ask you, uh, the first time I, I saw you was in um, Not Quite Human 2. Oh, my God. I, I got so I got so much to ask about that. Can you t- tell me, like, what that experience was like? Well, I remember, the most I remember about it is going to have a meeting with him. And, uh, at Disney. Mm-hmm. And, uh, hey, what the hell do they want me for this for? And so... <laughs> I had a nice meeting with them, and, and uh, they were interested in me. They made me an offer, so I went and met with them. And 
we talked about the role. I thought, well, you know, why not? And so I did, and uh, it was just great fun and uh, a stretch for me. And I love challenges, so uh, I, I enjoyed the hell out of that experience. I, I must confess, mm -hmm. almost everything I've ever done, I've liked doing. Yeah. I think there have been a couple of exceptions, even, even the fact that Hathaway could be difficult as a director and not and harsh with actors, except the star actors, he wasn't. But, um, other than that, I, I've never I never had any trouble with Henry, so I'm fine, but, but I've, I've enjoyed everybody I've ever worked with. Oh boy, I've worked with a lot of them, you know. Yeah, Academy sure Award have. winners, Emmy Award winners, um, stars, and uh, enjoyed every minute of it. I, I love doing what I do. Mm -hmm. And those of us who are blessed, including those of you and of your listeners, who are doing what they love to do, I say go for it. Because you regret never having tried. And right. if you love it, continue to do it. No matter what the consequences are or the success or you have, if you keep thinking of yourself as a failure just because you're doing okay and you're not a movie star or whatever you how you aspire to as a CEO, doesn't mean you don't have a, a function and a place and something to be proud of. So I say do what you love to do. Don't do things. I know so many people, friends of mine especially, especially lawyers, really don't like doing what they do, but they do it because they need the money. Yeah. Or they like they like the money, or they like some of the challenges of it. But mostly, some of them wanted to be other the things other than that, and, and did not pursue it and regret it. Right. So I know if another maybe you know a guy named Steve Joyner, do you? Steve Joyner. Yeah, you don't know. No. He does podcasts too, and he hasn't made money at it, mm -hmm. and his wife is after him like crazy because doing this. But I, if he loves to do it some way or another, he'll find, find a way to monetize it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you may, it's difficult to do with podcasts. But if you write books or, or do it, write something, mm -hmm. who knows what can happen? Right. Take the chance, I say. Yeah, I, I write, I do stand up comedy, I act in some things. Well, there you go. Yeah. So you made a, a career more or less out of it, to a degree. Do you work too? Do you have another job? Um, not anymore. I had a car accident a couple of years ago, so I'm collecting disability right now. I see. But I'm trying to uh, make that leap now because, you know, once something like that happens to you, you re-examine your priorities. Yeah, boys, I'm bad. I'm, I'm, more, I'm more driven now than I was two, two, three years ago, I'll tell you. Well, that's a plus for you. See how you took a negative and made it into a plus? Yep. We have to, we have to figure out ways to do that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And getting depressed is not the answer. Yeah, no. Not at all. Yeah. Getting active is the answer. Yeah. yeah. Doing something. I Take totally... a walk even if need be. Go out in the sun. I totally agree. I totally yeah. agree. But, um... Yeah, so it was a, so not quite human too was a good experience. Uh, Do you like working with um, Alan Thick and all of them? Well, I I known Alan before mm -hmm. because my wife and I had, uh, had done some game shows with him, and she knew him better than I did. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, he he was terrific. I mean, he's he's a you know, thoroughly professional guy. Yeah, and uh, had a lot of charisma. Yeah, and a nice guy, and uh, he got along great. Yeah, the whole experience was good. As I said, I can't, I can point to, point to a few anecdotes where things were difficult at times. Oh, you can go right ahead. Every journey, is, every journey has its bumps. Yeah. But uh, not to me on that show, not. Yeah. You know? Uh, I, I had a huge crush on Day Young. Well, you and a whole bunch of other people. Really? Everybody else did too? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't alone. I would love to be able to say, gee, Tommy, you're the only one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you weren't. No, you weren't. Sorry about that. You know, people get crushes on, on people, and they, oh, God knows they don't know who the hell they are. So, yeah. It's perfectly okay 
strange for you to have a crush on. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else you want to talk about that I can think of? Let me think about it. Oh, I wanted to mention, too, when I first saw that movie, I was like eight or nine, and I, I couldn't help but notice you looked like my uncle. Oh, my God. Uncle, what's, his, what's your uncle's name? Steve. Uncle Steve, huh? Yeah. He, oh, my God. He died about eight years ago. Well, who knows? You and I might be related. Who knows? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was very close to him, and um, I remember... I, I called my dad into the room. I was like, hey, Dad, that looks like Uncle Steve. And he was like, that's um, Tom from Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even he yeah, thought I so, too. All the time. I remember doing Mary Hartman. I did that play with Mia Farrow. And I would walk around the streets of New York when I was doing the play. Yeah. And, hey, Tom, how are you? I get Tom all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. But one time on the subway, though, what happened? I'm, I'm standing, I'm sitting in a car. Only... Four guys at the other end of the car. So later at night after the show. Yeah. And all of a sudden, these four guys. This was back in the '80s when life in New York, late mm-hmm. early '80s, life in New York was not actually '79, '80 was not so um, safe as it is today. Yeah. And I'm on the subway, and all of a sudden, these guys rushed at me. I thought, Oh my God. They're gonna take my money and kill me. Uh-huh. And that they came up and they said, "You're a movie star, right? You're a movie star." They were going on like that. I know you. I know. I know your face. And it was another guy said, "Yeah, his name is Tom." And <laughs> it was about having seen Mary Hartman, and they wanted my autograph. Oh my God! So what a release, right? Yeah. A, a costume with a knife, which I thought was gonna be pulled. Mm-hmm. They just wanted an autograph and say hello. Yeah, I've, I've heard... Uh, they ran at me. Oh, my God. Yeah, I've heard Jason Alexander from Seinfeld uh, tell a couple similar stories where he's been in danger in New York like that, and, you know, they, they knew who they, they knew who he was, and so they left him alone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that... The, 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 they were... They were... In my experience, it was not quite like that. They, they were looking to harm me. Yeah. They just wanted, they were excited to see somebody that they thought was somebody. Although the first guy didn't know who the hell I was, but he knew me, he knew my face. Mm-hmm. And thought me, immediately he wasn't trying to do me harm. He was just excited to see somebody on a train at around 10.30 to 11 o'clock at night. Nobody else on that particular car. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to have the habit, still do, of being on the first or last car. And there aren't that many people driving yeah. those two cars. In the less and the not rush hours, rush hours. Forget about it. Everything's full. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that was that was scary for a minute. Uh, and I bet Jason's was even more scary. Oh yeah, he 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 told a story about about uh, bullets flying like over his head and stuff once. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh wow, God, I never had that happen. The only experience I ever had was uh, in Hollywood at the corner of Highland and Franklin. Mm-hmm. And then there was a market there called Hughes Market. And I was living on Ivar Street, not Ivar, no, a lot. Mm-hmm. That's, that's for the east. Um, I, I forget the name of the street, but it was adjacent to, to the next street over from, on Franklin East. On, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but anyway. I was living there, and I didn't walk to the market. Mm-hmm. And I got my groceries, and all of a sudden, this cop car pulls up, siren blaring, and two cops jump out, and they frisk me, and me up against the wall. Yeah. And I'm being, I'm being handcuffed. I, I said, why, what, why, what, why? I hadn't done anything. I just been in the market. And they put me in the car, and then they got a blare on the, on the uh, radio that they'd caught the suspect, and that, I fit the description that they caught the guy that they were after and the, that they didn't even notify that, that I, I was in custody and they let me go. Oh, that's I good. I mistaken identity. They just thought I was this guy. I, I fit the description of the guy who just brought something. Well, wow. It wasn't me, for God's sakes, but that's scary when that happens. Something like that happens out of the blue. There's a cop, but nonetheless, uh, Jason's was even worse than that because they were not police. They uh, to do him harm. Thank God they recognized him, right? Yeah, I, 
I've been in that situation where like I'm walking late at night, a cop stops me, and one time a cop stopped me and said, is your name Gonzalez? And I'm like, do I look like a Gonzalez? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were lucky nothing happened, that's for sure. Yeah. They love. Maybe you are Gonzalez. <laughs> Go back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any um, upcoming projects you'd like to plug? Well, I have. I, as a matter of fact, I'm bringing a script to. I'm going to the George Street Playhouse where Joe Duchesne was new musical, or not new version of his original musical. Right. Being done. And I'm bringing a script with me that I'm interested in doing called The Eve of Beltane. Mm -hmm. It's an Irish take on The Eve of Beltane, which is the. Is, is a May date. It's the equinox between, halfway between June, the June equinox and, uh, and the uh, winter equinox. And uh, it's a spring, equinox, a spring festival in Ireland, and it's about that. And uh, mysterious things happen. And so, uh, so I'm interested in the script that I hope it was made into a musical. And there's a part in it for me that I want to play, and that's what I'm interested in doing. So I'm giving it to uh, David nice. Saint, the uh, artistic director of the George Street, where uh, a lot of original stuff is, is fostered and uh, worked on and made better. So I want to do it. take a look at the script and see if they can uh, make it even better than it is. Nice. Yeah. So that's what I'm most interested in, and I'm, I'm teaching. And until somebody offers me another part, um, I'm just cooling it for a month or two. And I'll, I'll be in L.A. probably over the holidays with my daughter. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I was in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago to uh, be interviewed for a documentary. Really? On what? Um, about, um, it's, like the, it's like the history of, of uh, movie extras. Oh, really? Yeah. And I, I've been an extra on a couple of things. So, like... I put my two cents in, and it was it was a lot of fun. Well, good for you. Yeah. Good for you. You know, there used to be, I'm not so much anymore, I don't think, but guys who did this for a living and they raised families being extras. Yeah. And, you know, because it was all guild in those days. They had no, there were no uh, non-union people doing doing movies. Yeah. You know, this proliferation of non-unionism -union, throughout the country has it's just been terrible for pocketbooks of people who, who were extras, mm -hmm. you know, could make a living. The middle class actor's on his way out. Yeah. He almost can't make a, make enough money to sustain a family in today's, today's economy Yeah. without doing another job uh, because they don't pay anymore unless you're a star. Yeah. They or you just lucky and get a series that gets to be a hit that is done more than one season. Right. You know, on cable, they don't pay that much on cable initially. Mm-hmm. And so, fragmented, fragmentation of, of the, of the uh, in a way it's good because new people can come in and create new stuff. Uh, but in another way it's not so good because they don't pay like they used to pay. Yeah. I used to make more money in, in the 70s than I do now. I'm filming television. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. If you're a big star, if you're a star, of course that's a different story, but most actors are not stars, big stars. And so, you know, those of us who are with a, a little notoriety like myself, they don't they don't want to pay anymore. Yeah. And you either take it or leave it. Lou Wasserman started that, the head of Universal, MCA Universal. Yeah. He started what they call top of the show. Mm-hmm. And if you put the price at $2,500 for a starring role on, a, on a, our television show, take it or leave it. And he created the take it or leave it proposition, which is we'll offer you this, take it or leave it, we'll find somebody else that will do it. And it did. He, he did. He broke, he broke the uh, going wage for an hour show, the star of an hour show, a guest star of an hour show. He broke that, that ceiling. Mm -hmm. And created a new one, a much lesser one, half that. He's not less than half that. But yeah. it had so, well, I'm, he, started, I'm, he also started charging employees for parking, but that didn't last very long. Yeah. 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 I'm hoping um, my interview with the documentary and the 
a couple music videos I've been an extra on will yeah. hopefully, you know, um, eventually get me my SAG card when I have the money for it. Yeah, I know. It used to be so much easier to become a SAG member because they didn't charge you that much, but now it's ridiculous. Yeah. You got Astra uh, with them. They have to because, you know, there's so much non-union stuff. They're not... I, many of my students are working, many of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're working because they're making money all, all non you. Right. Now, there are a few exceptions, but mostly non-union. The play I just did, the people that were working behind the scenes, mm-hmm. I, the assistant stage manager, uh, was doing two union commercials during the run of my play. Mm-hmm. Non-union commercials, rather. Right. And making it, and making it decent wage but that shouldn't be you know they should be all union because what happens they don't get any residuals yeah no residuals you get a flat fee and that's it yeah and then they they reap the profits they charge the client just as much money as they do the ad, the ad agency and the client and the, the product pay just as much for the commercial as they would if they were union actors but who pockets the, the profit the uh, Yeah, it's disgraceful. It's really... In, in, in a way it is because it's union busting. And what happens is, you get to be my age, we should be collecting a pension. You don't have any. Mm-hmm. Whatever, 401k or forget it. Yeah. And so, corporate America has to do, put, pull the wool over everybody's eyes by union busting and people right to work states. You know, don't know what they're doing, but the, the people who vote okay, I don't want to be a union member because I don't want to pay the dues. Mm-hmm. Because I don't believe in paying dues. I, I want to, but you get all the benefits of the union because the, the corporation has to pay the union people. And you're a beneficiary of the wage because they pay you the same. Mm-hmm. But you get, but you won't get a pension. The union people will. Yeah. So that's something to be considered. I think the pension will swing back, but it's going to be, take a while. Yeah. I don't know what your politics are, but with the current administration, uh, we're never going to be stand up for for labor. No. Even though some working people voted for the orange-haired one. Uh, I think that he will, but I don't think he will. No, I don't think he will either. No, I don't think so, because the corporate interests outweigh. The the only thing he, he really wants is more entrepreneurs and more profits for uh, corporations and people with uh, entrepreneurial spirits. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Anyway, I don't want to get into politics. <laughs> it will offend some of your listeners. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, I hope I hope I I hope you get invited to um, some autograph signing shows in California so I can meet you. Yeah. Well, I have to, to talk to the guy. Who, who does this, but I think he's, his province is the, west, the East Coast. A guy lives in New Jersey, so I suspect he, uh, no, wait a minute, no, he lives in New York State. I've been for a little bit. And uh, I uh, I don't think his province is California, but I, I have to put the word out and tell my agent to take a look, see what's out there. Maybe we'll meet. That'd be cool. Ah, oh, that would be so cool. Can I, yeah, Tommy, I'd like that. Can I add you as a friend on Facebook? I'm sorry? Can I add you as a friend on Facebook? Oh, of course. Awesome. Totally. Of course. Of course. Do. Sure. Anybody can. Yeah. And I'd be, I'd be honored. So, anyway, good luck. Thank you, sir. And uh, I'm going to watch the Dodgers play. That's awesome. And I'm going to root for it because my father worked for the Dodgers for 34 years as a coach. Mm-hmm. He managed in the farm system and then coached, became a coach in Brooklyn. And a coach in L.A. That's how I wound up in Los Angeles. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I have, his, I have the World Series ring from, from 1962. Wow. 1963. When they, they beat the Yankees four straight. Mm-hmm. 63, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, my dad has a, gave me that ring, so it's nice. And my brothers have it too, so. Did, did, did you try to play pro baseball? I, I did not. 
I, I was a, I played, I was captain of my college team, the co-captain of my college team. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I played in the Army when I was drafted. Mm -hmm. I played in the Army for short months, and then I played for Frankfurt am Main in Germany. And then I hurt my knee. I was a very good player. Mm -hmm. And the Giants were very interested in me, but then I hurt my knee, and they flew me back to Fort Dix and butchered my knee. The Army doctors, and I could never run fast, as fast as I used to. I was very fast. Mm -hmm. That's part of my game. I had a strong arm. I, I was a, a, a shouting report on me. It was outside chance to make the major leagues. I, so the Giants were interested in signing me, but I decided, to, well, if I can't run, I, you know, I'm not that big a guy. And uh, well, I'm strong for my size. Yeah. But I'm only being 5'10", I, uh, and being weighing only 155 pounds. Mm -hmm. I decided 160, I guess I was not, but, you know, I was not a great hitter, but I could field really well, and I was fast, and I could throw. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, if I had worked on it, if I had the training they have today, I, I would have had a good chance to make a major league, but those days, my father taught me a little bit, but he wasn't around during the summer much, and so he was either managing or playing, playing or managing. Mm-hmm. So I didn't learn a lot from him. And uh, the coaches I had were not that great, so my skills were pretty much self-taught. Yeah, my dad, he played uh, baseball and football growing up, and um, he always wanted me to play those sports, especially baseball, but um, he never forced me to. Baseball was never my game, but I did play football in high school, and he was very proud of that. Oh, I bet he was, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I had fun with that. I'll bet. That's, well, that's the game in high school. Are you kidding me? Not baseball. Football is the game. Football and basketball, I suppose. Oh, our basketball and baseball teams, they were actually a lot better than our football teams were. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so, but nonetheless, you were a Friday night hero at times, right? At times. We won, like, maybe three games a season. <laughs> yeah. It was fun, though, right? It was so much fun. I mean, I would do it again. It was a blast. Oh, great. Lucky you didn't get too many head injuries. No. You okay? You get a little older. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, really great talking to you. You too, Greg. I appreciate it so much. To all your listeners, I wish them well. And if you ever get to New York, give me a shot through that uh, number I gave you. Oh, absolutely, sir. Thank you. All right. God bless. Take care. And we'll, we'll talk soon, Tommy, I'm sure. Okay. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.